All right, so this video is for the public visceral. This again is brought to you by the Scrubs team, which is a student club of resources for understanding and for the success. As always, a brief, brief uh, mention of our mission statement. Our mission statement is that Scrubs is a student-driven initiative that is aiming to develop supplemental resources for current and future cohorts that will pass through Brody. We participate on a variety of subcommittees working to create resources for students by students. We try to offer a unique perspective from students that have walked through the course um, in the same shoes that you will be following and develop resources that we wish we had been exposed to during our time in the course. The hope is that this will eventually become a staple of the Brody student body, exemplifying the unique collaborative community that Brody offers. And if this is a mission that aligns with your goals, we'd love to have you join the team. As always, brief disclaimer that um, these resources are not all inclusive and they are made by students, so there is a possibility for errors, although we do our best to vet these um, so that way the errors are not occurring. If there is a contradiction at any point, please go by your course materials and please do not use these resources as a replacement for your Brody instruction, but rather as a supplement. With that, let's get into the actual anatomy of this chapter. So this is going to be the chapter for pelvic viscera, so we're going to start with the urinary system. Let's start up with the ureters. So the ureters are coming from a superior position down inferiorly as they connect the kidneys to the bladder. So the main thing that you need to know about the ureters is their relative position to two structures, um, one in the male and one in the female anatomy. So in the female anatomy, it is important to know that the ureter is going to pass inferior to the uterine artery. So ureter passes inferior to the uterine artery, which is located here. And in the male, the ureter is going to pass down towards the bladder inferiorly to this structure in purple here, which is the vas deferens, or ductus deferens, depending on which resource you're using. So the way that you remember this is that water passes under the bridge. So water, so it makes sense, urine is going to enter the bladder by passing underneath the bridge. In the males, that's the vas deferens, and in the females, that is the uterine artery. And we'll talk a little bit more later in this video about what structure the uterine artery runs through, but it's important to know that the ureter is going to pass underneath, and that the uterine artery, um, when it is cut during a hysterectomy procedure where the uterus is removed, you have to be careful not to injure the ureter as it's passing down within the same region. Now, talking about the bladder itself. The bladder is uh, composed of three layers of muscle um, that is going to make up the detrusor muscle, and it is under autonomic nervous system control, specifically the parasympathetic nervous system. So the parasympathetic nervous system is going to receive sensation here, um, that is going to be GVA fibers, and then the detrusor muscle is going to contract under the guidance of the parasympathetic um, efferent system, so GVE fibers. Now I want to point out here, we see that we have this triangular structure of smooth uh, it's a smooth region in the bladder. You'll actually see this in lab, and this is going to be our urinary trigone. So our urinary trigone is made up um, of the triangle that is formed between the, uh, the ureter orifices on either side. So this is where the ureters empty into the bladder. And then down inferiorly, um, this is going to be your urethral opening. Okay, So that is going to form your urinary trigone, which is a smooth surface in the bladder. You'll see that the rest of this bladder surface in lab is, um, has frugae in it, uh, meaning that it's folded over on itself, and that allows it to distend when it fills uh, with urine. Okay, and then lastly, I want to point out that this sphincter, the internal urethral sphincter, is a functional sphincter. It's not an actual anatomical sphincter, um, but this is going to be under the guidance of sympathetic innervation. So in males, uh, it will actually, during orgasm, the sympathetic innervation will supply the internal urethral sphincter will cause contraction, which keeps semen from coming back into the bladder, which is called retrograde ejaculation, which we'll learn about at a later point um, in the course. Now, talking about the urethra. Um, the urethra in males is composed of three different segments, so let's follow it from the bladder. So the urethra, just as a definition, is going to take urine from the bladder out of the body. So this entire structure here is going to be the urethra. Now the urethra in males is going to start from the bladder and is going to descend through the middle of the prostate. So while it is in the region of the prostate, this is called the prostatic urethra. Makes sense, going through the prostate. Now it is going to go through the deep perineal pouch and it is going to pass through um, this muscle layer here, which is your uh, pelvic floor. So as you're passing through the deep perineal pouch, this is going to be the membranous portion as it's passing through into the perineum. So here you go with the membranous portion of the urethra. Within this uh, membranous portion, 
again looking at a deep cranial pouch, I want to indicate that posteriorly we have the bulbourethral gland. So the bulbourethral gland is located posteriorly in the same region as the membranous uh, urethra. However, as you'll see right here, the actual entrance of the bulbourethral gland duct into the urethra is in this last section of the urethra, which is your spongy urethra. So spongy urethra is located only in males, and it is going to come down all the way to the urethral orifices to allow urine to be expelled from the body. And once again, the bubble urethral gland is located in the region of the membranous urethra, but it does not join, the duct does not join the urethra until it gets to the spongy urethra. Um, other points I want to point out that your course pack makes is the piboprostatic ligament. This is going to come from the pubis and go to the prostate. That is just going to help um, the prostate and the bladder stay rigid in this region, so that way it's not got too much um, flexibility and movement uh, in the body. All right, and then I do want to point out one more time that here we have our duct deferens, so epididymis um, with our testes. This is going to be carrying sperm up, so the vas deferens runs up. Remember, it's going to be running through our inguinal uh, triangle, going through the superficial and deep inguinal rings, and then as we come posteriorly, it is wrapping superior to the ureter, which is coming down from above. So wrap superiorly, and then it is going to join the uh, seminal gland. And once the seminal gland is join, joins the uh, vas deferens, this is now going to be called the ejaculatory duct. So the junction of the vas deferens and the seminal gland form the ejaculatory duct, which will then enter the prostate. We'll talk about it a little bit later. Now, just to point out, in females, the females also have the urethra. The urethra is going to open up into the vestibule of the vagina, um, and it is located anteriorly. So you have the clitoris, followed by the urethra, followed by the vaginal canal. And then posteriorly, you'll have the rectum. Um, the urethra in females does not have a spongy component, the, and we don't really call it membranous or prostatic. You can't call it prostatic because they don't have a prostate. But this, uh, this derivative of the urethra is a component that is derived from the same embryonic structures that the membranous and prostatic urethra were derived from. Now, talking about the male prostatic urethra and structures of the pelvic viscera, we're going to start with the um, urethra. Where Chris Beck mentions some structures that we need to know, uh, specifically in the region of the prostate in that posterior aspect. We have this midline um, enlargement. That is going to be your prostatic, uh, sorry, your urethral crest. So on the back of the urethra, you have the urethral crest. As you come towards the midline, there's a larger swelling of that urethral crest, which is, um, which is then called the seminal colliculus. So the seminal colliculus is located in the center. And we can actually see these structures a little bit more clear in the zoomed image on the right. So your urethral crest, then you have the sem uh, seminal colliculus right here. In the center of that, you have your prostatic utricle. So that's that little hole located right there. Um, fun fact, the prostatic utricle is the homologue to the uterus and the uh, superior region of the vagina in the female. And then right here on either side of the prostatic utricle, um, you have the ejaculatory duct openings, which is where um, that the vas deferens, as we mentioned before, coming through vas deferens, it joins the seminal gland to form the ejaculatory duct, and those ejaculatory ducts empty out here. And then over here, this is your prostatic sinus on either side of um, the uh, urethral crest. And then that is where you're going to have prostatic ducts that are opening to allow um, the fluids from the prostate into the, your, um, the semen that will be produced during orgasm in males. So um, talking about the fluids that are released during ejaculation, the seminal gland is producing a thick alkaline fluid, which helps to neutralize the pH of the vagina. And then the prostate is providing a thin milky fluid, which has a lot of the nutrients that are going to be allow um, sperm to make their journey um, through the female reproductive system to fertilize the egg. Now, this is just another view of the male viscera from a um, side section. So we're just going to go through this one more time. Again, we have the epididymis going into the vas deferens, which runs again through those inguinal rings coming back posteriorly. It is going to pass superior to the ureter. Again, the ureter is going from the kidney, joining the bladder. Um, this is the uh, water under the bridge mnemonic. As we come posteriorly, we're going to join the seminal gland to form the ejaculatory duct, which drains into the prostate. And then from the prostate, we're going to get additional fluids that are going to drain out through the prostatic urethra, membranous urethra, and then spongy urethra out uh, to the external regions of the body. Now, if we move into a female pelvic viscera, the main thing that you have to um, indicate here is that we have the uterus. 
So the uterus is located internally and we access the uterus by going through the vaginal canal. So the vaginal canal opening into the um, vesicle of the vagina, it then runs superiorly. And then at the bottom, or sorry, at the top of the vagina, we are going to have the cervix. The cervix has an internal and an external os, but the region, so the cervix kind of pouch, pooches down into the vaginal canal. Now that means that there are spaces that run all the way around. And we can kind of see that here. These are gonna be called vaginal fornices. We're gonna have one on the posterior surface, one on the anterior surface, and then two on the lateral surfaces. So these are just areas where the cervix has pouched down around so the vaginal um, canal continues superiorly and makes kind of a ring around the cervix. And these will be important because this is gonna allow access to different structures um, that we'll talk about in the clinical anatomy portion. Now, as we come up, the cervix, I mean, sorry, <laughs> the uh, uterus is composed mostly of muscle, um, and it's actually really impressive. It'll grow during pregnancy to almost 10 times the size. Um, and you'll learn a little bit more about the histological features in another course. So what I want to point out here is that you have a fundus, which is the top of the cervix, and you have a body of the cervix. Um, and sorry, body of the, I keep saying cervix, body of the uterus. And then what's important to know is in order for the eggs that are released by the ovaries to become fertilized, they have an implant into the uh, body of the uterus, they have to somehow have a connection to get to the uterus. So the way that we do this is via the fallopian tubes, which are located here more laterally. So the fallopian tubes have this end component, which are called fimbrae, which then go into the infundibulum, followed by the ampulla, which is the opening. Um, and then we're going to get into the isthmus. And then lastly, there will be a uterine portion where it's passing into the uterine wall. And then, and then if that egg should be fertilized, it'll come down and it'll implant somewhere into the uh, endometrial layer of the uterus. Now, um, so one thing I want to point out from this image is that it shows, does show pretty clearly that the ovary is not directly attached to the fallopian tubes, which is a common misconception. The ovaries are instead held in place by the ovarian ligament, which attaches to the uterus directly. So there's an ovarian ligament holding the ovaries in place. Then when an egg is released, it's kind of released up here into this um, fibrous fimbrae structure which hopefully then allows it to travel through the fallopian tube. If it instead does not get released and go into the fallopian tubes, then you can have an ectopic pregnancy somewhere in the abdomen. Now, continuing our discussion on the pelvic viscera, um, for females, uh, really we want to talk about the broad ligament and the different components that make up the broad ligament. So um, the broad ligament is a double layer of peritoneum, which is going to um, help support the different structures that run in the region of the uterus. And so what I want to point out here, kind of on the bottom, is that there's three separate components of this. There's the mesometrium, which is around the uterus itself. There is the mesosalpinx. Salpinx, that suffix, is referring to the uh, fallopian tubes. So that just means that the broad ligament in relation to the fallopian tubes. And then there is the mesoavarium which is the region of the broad ligament, which is corresponding to the ovary. And here you can see in the sagittal plane, the mesometrium, mesosalpinx, and then that uh, mesoovarian surrounding the ovaries. Now, the broad ligament is going to expand on either side of the uterus, and it has a couple of different ligaments that run through it. Um, one of which is this cardinal ligament, also known as the transverse cervical ligament. Um, this ligament is really important because it is what the uterine artery and vein run through. I'm supplying, so we can actually see that here, the uterine artery and vein running to supply the uterus. Um, this will be wrapped up in the transverse cervical ligament. And what is important to this is we remember that the uterine artery passes superior to the ureter. And we can actually see that drawn in here. So there's a ureter passing inferior to the uh, uterine artery. Um, other things I want to point out here is right here we have a ligament that is going to supply the ovaries. This is the suspensory ligament of the ovary. Um, or you might see this as the infundibular pelvic ligament as well. Now, I want to point out that this suspensory ligament of the ovary is containing the gonadal arteries. In this case, it'll be the ovarian arteries, which is supplying blood flow to the ovary itself. And lastly, we have the round ligament, which is coming off kind of at the junction of the fallopian tubes and the uh, fundus. And that is going to be going out again, same region as the somatic cord and males. It's going to go through the abdominal wall. It's going to pass through the inguinal uh, rings, and then it is going to go into the region of the labia majora. Now, the last thing that 
um, we want to talk about before we get into the clinical anatomy is the pouches of the pelvis. So they're going to be slightly different in males and females because females have an additional structure in their pelvis that is the uterus. So for males, we're going to have the rectovesicular pouch. So this is between the rectum and the vesicular region, which is going to refer to the bladder. So um, this is a female structure, so we can't show that, but it would just be, imagine this uterus wasn't here, it'd be this region right located here. So between the rectum and the bladder. Then we have a pubovesicular pouch, which is just between the um, pubic symphysis and the bladder. In females, we have the pubovesicular pouch as well, again, pubis and bladder. But now we have an additional pouch, the vesicular uterine pouch, which is between the bladder and the uterus. So it would be located right here. And then lastly, we have the rectouterine pouch located posteriorly between the rectum and the uterus. And this will be important for a clinical core um, that we'll talk about briefly. So three clinical correlations that I want to point out. The first is nephrolithiasis, which is a fancy word for saying kidney stones. Um, there are three locations that kidney stones are most likely to occur. One is at the junction between the uh, uteropelvic junction, which is where the um, kidney empties up out uh, from the renal pelvises into the ureter. Um, so this is one location. Then as we go inferiorly, as we cross over the iliacs, so in this case, it's the common iliacs, um, that is going into the pelvic rim because this is uh, in 3D, it's actually going a little bit anterior or inferior. Um, it can cause a stricture here. So that is another place for kidney stones to often become trapped in the pelvic rim. And lastly, as the ureter is entering the bladder, that is the ureto-vesicular junction, this is the final place that kidney stones are often trapped. So remember these three, ureto-pelvic junction, pelvic rim, and ureto-vesicular junction, we are thinking about common locations for stones to be trapped coming from the kidneys. Okay, um, another very common presentation that you'll see in older male individuals is benign prostate hyperplasia. Uh, this is when the prostate becomes enlarged. Um, and what this can do is it can cause closure of the prostatic uh, urethra, as we can see indicated here, and that can cause urinary retention, um, meaning that the bladder is unable, the detrusor muscle is unable to push urine out. And you'll actually see in pathology that you'll see some um, bladders that have come from individuals with benign prostatic hyperplasia, and actually the bladders will come really, really thick and strong and muscular because they're having to force, uh, they're, they're having to create so much pressure to force urine out through this um, a hyperplase, hyperplastic prostate. This will also be the case with some um, prostate cancers. If there is a nodule that is growing in the region of the paraurethral segment, then it can also cause compression, um, leading to retention of urine. Lastly, I want to mention the transvaginal access to the pouch of Douglas, which is your rectovesicular pouch. Um, this is when a needle is placed through the vagina, and it goes into the region behind the cervix. So remember, this is the posterior fornix, the punch in between the um, uterus and the rectum, which will give you the retrovesicular pouch or the pouch of Douglas. And this allows you to sample if there's any fluids that are being accumulating um, at the inferior portion of the pelvic, or sorry, the abdominal cavity. Okay, so that is transvaginal access of the pouch of Douglas. And that brings us to an end of this video.